In The Witcher games, the North is often juxtaposed with the South. Whilst the North stands for a degree of freedom, the South is seen as a sort of repressive hegemony, a mass conglomerate that threatens to swallow the Northern Kingdoms. But what is the North actually like by the start of the third Witcher game? What kingdoms are there, and is the North really a land of freedom and self-determination? To start, there are a number of kingdoms in the north. To the far north is the kingdom of Kovir and Povis. These are perhaps the wealthiest lands in the entire north, as they export the most minerals in the entire world. It's grown into a mighty kingdom based on the sale of silver, gold, copper, platinum and iron, and by maintaining neutrality in the wars between Nilfgaard and the other northern kingdoms, Kovir and Povis have become wealthy on wartime trade. But that's not to say these are simply lands of trade. Because it's so wealthy, this kingdom can hire the best mercenary armies in the entire world, a reason why it hasn't been conquered by some of the larger northern kingdoms. Adjacent to Kovir is the Hengfors League. This is very much a minor union of small lands and principalities that is quite like Kovir in that it's a trade estate that tends to retain neutrality. By far the most powerful and ambitious kingdom is Redania, headed by King Radovid. Redania is the only northern kingdom that has the strength to now oppose the Nilfgaardians. It is indeed the most powerful of the northern kingdoms. Redania is a kingdom situated on the western coast of the northern segment of the continent, and it's extremely wealthy because of its agricultural produce. It's considered by many to be the breadbasket of the north, although its dominance in regard to farming is threatened by Nilfgaard, which continues to pour its cheaply made goods and grain into many of the northern kingdoms. But Redania can boast because it controls the city of Oxenfurt and the university there. The university is an institution that's world renowned for its teaching and scholarly work, and it's considered by many to be the best university in the world of the Witcher. But Redania is somewhat unique for the northern kingdoms kingdoms because of the strength of its rigid hierarchy. There exists an intense cult of nobility, as it is your birth and not your wealth or skill that largely determines your place in society. This is in part responsible for Redania arguably having the world's best cavalry force. Noblemen are trained from birth to fight on horseback. To the east of Redania lies Kedwin. This is the youngest and largest of the northern kingdoms, having only been formed around 200 years ago. But quite recently, the kingdom was invaded and annexed by Redania as part of King Radovid's attempts to build up a conglomerate of northern states fit to oppose the Nilfgaardians. But in the past, Kedwin has been viewed with some disdain consistently by the other kingdoms. It's seen as backwards and aggressive, as it's invaded kingdoms to its south before, and it's also home to a famous school for witches. But more important to us, perhaps, is the fact that Kedwin is the home of Kaer Morhen, the home of the school of the wolf witches such as Geralt of Rivia. To the south of Kedwin is Edern, a very similar sort of kingdom due to its founding being similarly belated. However, the Kedwenis tend to despise the kingdom of Edern because it's more prosperous than its northern cousin. As it is further south, Edern possesses more fertile lands and the mountains in its vicinity hold great mineral wealth. However, the province has suffered much since the commencement of war with Kedwin and Nilfgaard, and it's a shadow of its former glory. Directly to the south of Redania is Temeria. This is a conquered and shattered kingdom, and at the start of The Witcher 3, the Nilfgaardians occupy its capital, Vizima. It was once one of the strongest and proudest of the kingdoms, but no more. Another diminished kingdom is the kingdom of Lyria and Rivia, Rivia being the namesake of Geralt, who was named of Rivia formerly after his valour in a battle against Nilfgaard. But Lyria and Rivia was conquered by Nilfgaard, and although it has somewhat recovered, it doesn't retain much of its former strength. There's also the kingdom of Sidaris, 
which is small but vivid and prosperous, and thought to be ruled by one of the best kings to exist. Dandelion comments that the king of Sidaris is wise, just, enlightened, and he tends to be isolationist, although he does generally support the north against Nilfgaard. Another set of lesser kingdoms are Verdun, Brugge, and Kerak. They lie next to a vast forest and they are pretty weak, and not that interesting other than if you consider that they come into contact with the Dryads a fair amount. On the whole though, these kingdoms remain fairly poor and small. And finally, we have the free city of Novigrad, which I think deserves a mention as it's the most populated city in the entire north, and one of the biggest cities in the world, if not the biggest. It's labelled by Dandelion as being like a fat merchant in an inn's alcove, surrounded by the similarly familiar smell of sweat and money. It is one of the greatest ports in the world. It houses eight banks and 40 inns, and it's home to the most prosperous merchant companies in the entire world. So one of the questions I posed at the beginning of this video was whether it's true to say that the North is this land of self-determined free states that juxtapose with the Nilfgaardian Empire. Well, this isn't an accurate statement. The Northern Kingdoms have always tried to invade and annex each other, so there isn't really a sense that they want to respect each other's borders like you might otherwise think. For instance, Radovid V, the King of Redania, invaded Kedwin instead of attacking Nilfgaard. He did so in order to bolster his strength and it's just one of many examples of how the Northern Kingdoms do tend to take advantage of each other. Contrary to what you might want to believe, that Nilfgaard is evil and the North is good, this is far from the truth, and the complexity of the matter is illustrated well in the various endings you can get at the end of The Witcher 3. For example, in the ending where Nilfgaard is defeated, you can end up with a particular ending where Radovid builds a sort of Northern Empire to oppose Nilfgaard. Perhaps the only reason that the North has remained so fractured and full of various kingdoms for so long has been because there's been no dire circumstance which has allowed an opportunist such as Radovid to dominate. I don't think you can say that the Northern Kings really want to remain as fractured as they are. Every kingdom thinks that they have a right to expand, the same as Nilfgaard. It's just chance and opportunity may not have allowed for that so far. Although, I have to admit, the one sense in which the North can really be considered free is in terms of its fashion. You only have to visit Vizima to see how every Nilfgaard wears black, whereas there are way more colours in the North. Anyway, I hope this has been a useful overview of the northern states of the continent by the start of The Witcher 3. If you're wondering what source I've used, I've predominantly used a book called The World of the Witcher that you can buy on Amazon. It's really interesting and it's got some pretty nice illustrations. Anyway, thanks again and I'll see you in the next one.